It is now my pleasure to introduce this morning's commencement speaker. Dr. Cornell West is no stranger to our university. In fact, we were just saying, I think he's been with us on half a dozen occasions prior to this, over the very many years since I've been president. A professor, philosopher, author, and activist, his moving orations never fail to inform and inspire. He's currently the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Chair at Union Theological Seminary. The former professor of practice of public philosophy at Harvard University and professor emeritus at Princeton University has proven himself to be a cha champion of truth. His commitment and dedication to advocate for equity with his signature mix of passion and fire shines a white heart spotlight on injustice while helping to show the way to a better tomorrow. Please join me in welcoming to our stage, a very good friend of our university, a true social justice warrior and unflinching scholar, Dr. Cornell West. Oh, what a blessing, what an honor, what a privilege to be here. Let us salute first the class of 2022, 2021, and 2020. That's what we're here for. Oh, we affirm what you have already done. Let us give it up again for President LaShawn Smith Williams. Pandemic, did you get every letter, every meaning, every interpretation of that word? I want to salute the captain of the ship. 11 high quality years of service to this historic institution. I'm talking about my dear brother, President David Carlisle, MD, PhD, lover of this institution. Give it up for our brother. First Lady Sylvia, Dr. Sylvia Carlisle as well, sitting next to my beloved wife, Anna Hita. Give it up for Sylvia. Oh, yes. Sister Amy and Brother David, their precious children. Why? Because we know when you come to a, a gathering like this, Sly Stone says it's a family affair. Isn't that the truth? None of us self-made. None of us gave birth to ourselves. None of us taught ourselves our language. None of us shaped and molded us in ways we couldn't conceive of. It's a family affair. And I must say, my dear sister Deborah Provost, I've known her for 40 years. She's like family interim pro provost. Give it up for our dear sister. And oh, Charles Drew. Who we don't have language, words fall short of what he exemplifies, and we have his daughter, J.D. Esquire, storyteller. Sylvia Drew Ivy, give it up for him. Brother Ben, my dear sister as well, Stanford. I go on and on and on. But when I get to moments like this, it's what we call kairos. Kairos is a meaning informed moment. It's not just chronos. Something special is going on. And we get a chance to reflect on who we really are at our best because we're living at a moment where the society seems to be at its worst. We living in a moment in which the hounds of hell have been unleashed in unprecedented ways of organized hatred and institutionalized greed and routinized fear and chronic hypocrisy. How are we going to be countervailing forces against it? That's what these classes are all about. You all constitute the glue that holds together this fragile democracy undergoing an unraveling. And if we don't stand up in the name of the Charles Drews and others, who will? So we start with ourselves. I don't believe in name calling. I don't believe in finger pointing. I start with myself. I'm a crack vessel. And I have to make a decision just like these precious graduates. I have to decide 
What kind of human being I want to be in my short move from my mama's womb to tomb? Will I be willing to serve? Because I don't know about you, but I am who I am because somebody loved me. Somebody cared for me. Somebody attended to me. Somebody nursed me. Not just physically, but psychically and spiritually. Because I come from a great people, a black people, who at our best, in the face of 400 years of chronic hatred, just keep dishing out love warriors every generation. Every generation. That's right, in this country. We're talking about Frederick Douglass. We're talking about Ida B. Wells Barnett. We're talking about Fannie Lou Hamer. We're talking about Martin Luther King Jr. What was Martin Luther King Jr. about? And I could ask my dear brother, Dr. Mark Ridley Thomas, who played such an important role in helping sustain this institution, <laughs> along with Mervyn Domley, sustaining this institution, but in the face of hatred, refusing to hate back but tempt, choosing to be love warriors. And I know as nurses, you all understand John Coltrane's love supreme. Is that right? You understand Tony Beloved's, Tony Morrison's beloved? You understand what that care is all about. We're not talking about in the abstract. We're talking about on the ground. We're talking about when you touch and feel and grin and hug and nurse body to body, soul to soul, eye to eye, person to person. This is no deodorized discourse about abstract care. We keep it funky at Charles R. Drew. And when you keep it funky, you're in contact with those flat stone called everyday people. You got intimate relations to those James Cleveland called ordinary people because there are extraordinary things going on in the hearts and minds of ordinary people. And there's greatness in everyday people, because somewhere I read, he or she is greatest among you will be your servant. He or she who will be great will have a quality of service and a courage and a willingness to take a risk for something bigger than them. Now I learned in Shiloh Baptist Church, but you can learn in a whole lot of other places. Malcolm X learned it in the mosque. My sister Bell Hooks learned it in the Buddhist temple. James Baldwin was an agnostic, but he understood love on a very deep way. So no one of us, and no religious tradition, has a monopoly on the kind of love and care and service to the least of these. But we have to be honest in terms of where we come down, what motivates us, and how will we be long distance runners? Because when you have a vocation of being a nurse and a servant, that's not just a quick choice of a lifestyle. That's a calling, as our brother said. That's a vocation. You're going to be a long distance runner. Class 20, 20, 2021, 20, 2022. 20, Are you choosing to be long distance runners? Are you choosing to be long distance runners? We don't want no sprinters coming out of the blocks and we run into you two years later. You say, I ran out of gas. <laughs> oh, that love stuff was too much for me. No, justice is what love looks like in public, just like tenderness is what love feels like in private. So if you get a little tired, turn on a little Otis Redden, that genius from Macon, Georgia. He said, try a little tenderness. Uh, listen to a little baby face, a uh, tender Roni. And it's not a function of skin pigmentation. It's the choice that you make no matter what color you are, no matter what gender you are, no matter what sexual orientation you are, no matter what your national identity is. Because there's black gangsters and black thugs just like there's Martin Luther King Jr.'s and Fannie Lou Hamer's. And I know I was a gangster before I met Jesus and now I'm just a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. <laughs> so I'm critical of myself, calling myself in the question to do what? To fall back on the best that has come inside of me. So when we see you, 
We see your mamas and your daddies and your grandmamas and your granddaddies and your aunts and uncles and your teachers and your coaches and your intellectual ancestors, whoever they are. It could be Wallace Link, Soyenka of Nigeria. It could be Marquez of Columbia country, not Columbia University. That is the best of Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science. Why? Because in the midst of all of the dimness, all of the bleakness, all of the darkness, you have chosen to be beacons of light and to choose to be beacons of light means you're going to have to cut radically against the grain. Even when the airplanes fly over your commencement, you still got a smile on your face. That's part of what I'm talking about. And because I come from a people in the face of trauma for 400 years, keep dishing out wounded healers rather than just wounded herders. In the face of terror, from the plantation and the lynching tree, the police out of control, to killing each other in the hood. We still keep dishing out joy spreaders. That's what it is to choose service. Not just now, but any time, but especially at a moment where we're on the brink of nuclear catastrophe, escalating ecological catastrophe, grotesque wealth inequality, that's an economic catastrophe, but most importantly, spiritual and moral catastrophe. Not enough people choosing love and care and willingness to serve the weak and the vulnerable. That's what you are choosing at this commencement, keeping alive the best of the legacy of Charles R. Drew and so many who came before. And I'm going to sit down. No, because once this fire hits me, I don't know what happened. But I tell you this, when I look in your eyes, and you know the eyes are the windows of your soul, I feel a hope. I'm not talking about no cheap American optimism that believes in the green light and things are always going to get better. No. I'm talking about people who choose hope. So you're never surprised by any evil. You're never paralyzed by despair. You a blues woman, you a jazz man, and blues is nothing but catastrophe lyrically expressed, and jazz is about the freedom to be a force for good and hope in the midst of overwhelming catastrophe so that none of the darkness has a last word. You constitute that light. Sometimes it's just a flickering candle, but it's still a light. Three classes I'm speaking to, never give up on your light, never give up on your calling, never give up on your vocation. Let us work together, struggle together, and never forget about your magnificent experience in this historic institution with our memories of the best and our willingness to serve those who come after.